welcome to stewardship series where we today will be talking about conservation easements um, and just some zoom stuff uh, if you have any questions uh, feel free to pop them in the chat box and then we'll bring them up uh, later we do have a question slide at the end of this um, and today's speaker is Alan Lipschitz. He is our Director of Land Conservation. He has been with the organization for 20 years now and has done, I think all of, is it all of the conservation easements? All the like one. one. So he is very experienced and knows his stuff for sure. Um, so he'll go through all the steps today. All right, Sarah, thank you. Uh, thank you, Lynn. Thanks for having me. I'm getting a little echo. See if that helps. Thanks. That's a little bit better. Hey, welcome. Um, I'm glad folks can make it and we could talk a little bit about uh, conservation easements and the work we do. And really, you know, we'll go through some slides and I'll give some examples and just, you know, if you have a question, put it in the chat. And you know, Sarah could bring it up, or if you want to bring something up, I, I like to do these pretty informally. Uh, so I'm just going to kick it off. Uh, as Sarah mentioned, uh, I'm Elon Lipschitz, uh, and I've been a little forks a while, done a lot of projects, worked on a lot of different things, um, and you know, I look forward to sharing some of my experience and going from there. Um, just a little bit about Little Forks for folks that aren't familiar. Uh, we were established in 1996. Uh, uh, basically with a focus on protecting the Titabawassee River watershed. But really what we focus mainly on is Gladwin, Midland, and Clare counties. Uh, we're a nonprofit 501c3 conservation organization, and we do a variety of things. When I first started, a lot of the work we did was on conservation easements. Over that time, we've really expanded into other programming, environmental education, uh, managing natural areas and land, and then also working as a partner in our community. We're involved in uh, work locally in, in Midland with schools. We're also involved with uh, uh, multiple of watershed groups and other, other partners that are all working together to kind of both provide education and improve our natural environments. So, you know, and so really, I think people always think about, you know, what does a conservancy do? How do we operate? Um, and really, when you think about it is, you know, we were formed mainly to protect those unique areas, those rivers and streams that are really kind of the dominant feature of our area. And we use a variety of tools and these aren't necessarily in order. And I'll be honest, that one of the first thing that pops up is education. So when, you know, the first thing I do is when I meet with the landowner, it's really providing some education, letting folks learn a little bit about us, and then also learning about people and their land and seeing if we could find a way to work together. But as I mentioned, you know, we have nature preserves. So the Conservancy manages a little over 850 acres of land. Uh, we work with landowners to develop conservation easements. Uh, occasionally organizations, we work with our partners like the government uh, to help them acquire lands or to help with other projects. And stewardship is the key. And that's what, you know, kind of what the stewardship series is really all about is providing that education on these topics that could, you know, help People understand more what we do and also uh, ways to improve things in our area. So where do we work? As I mentioned, the Titabawassee River watershed is a huge area. It's made up as part of the Saginaw Bay watershed. Uh, um, and you'll see all those dots on those maps are different projects we've completed uh, over the years. Some as far down as Montcalm County out in Macosta or Bay County. And most of those dots that you're looking are conservation easements but a handful of different properties that we own and manage. The one thing I always like to talk about, because you know, we don't do any of this work really without landowners. I mean, they are the backbone that helps us protect these areas. And you know, I would, I'd be completely remiss if I didn't go over some examples, talk about some of these people, because it's really people's stories and kind of why they come to us. I mean, Initially, they don't come and say, hey, I wanna have a conservation easement. They come and say, I've got this piece of property. I love it. I wanna see it, um, you know, remain, you know, kind of not necessarily the way it is, but protected and protecting those natural features. 
And the very first conservation easement we did was, was almost 21 years ago now with Don Blades. And Don was a Gladwin resident. He was our very first conservation easement. And we'll, we'll see a slide a little bit later of Don's property. I like to use that as an example. But he was concerned about uh, the natural resources. He farmed his property. He lived on it. He had a, a pretty deep connection to it and came to us trying to see how can I keep that farmland, which you'll see part of his property's farmland, keep those woods uh, intact. And so another landowner that we also worked with uh, back in 2003 and 2005, I mean, sometimes we work with people on multiple projects uh, as folks either acquire land or include additional land on their property is, is CO Bauer. And CO I consider is kind of a, has been an inspiration. I, I've had so many lunches with C.O. Bauer, I can't even count them anymore, but uh, he's a World War II veteran, uh, a strong supporter of his local community in Montcalm. And he approached Little Forks when, you know, initially he had some concern about, he was approached by the, the local school district and they said, hey, your farm would make a great new high school. And he's like, I don't ever wanna see anything happen to this property. So C.O. has a, a property that is predominantly agricultural and forest land that he's used for for fishing and hunting and growing crops. Um, right now, honestly, it's been in his family over 80, 90 years now, probably almost 100 years if I really did the math. But uh, the CEO approached, oops, sorry, I went too far. CEO approached us about finding, you know, how can I keep this property the way it is? And, you know, I think he provides as much education to me as I think I tried to him and even more so. So if I had every bit of knowledge I've learned on our lunches, it would be pretty immense. Um, but you'll see, one thing I love about CEO is he always points at things and always has to be, photographs have to be acting and doing something. So, you know, he's done habitat improvements on his project, on his property, uh, taking some farmland that wasn't as productive and turning it into natural grasses. And, um, you know, has been a, a great steward of the land. Another project we just completed uh, in 2016 with uh, Sally Hightower and Linda Caldwell, uh, Twisted Oak Tree Farm there. Gladwin residents. They have a property that is, uh, as you can see by all the different programs, they participate in a tree farm. They work with the district. It's NEEP certified, which means it's environmental, environmentally verified. And if I had an updated photo, it actually has a little, for, little fork sign on this now too. So we work with Sally to kind of help protect this woods. You know, she's actively managed the property and has really wanted to see these nice trees and continue have the property continue to be forest land and, and still continue to be a sustainable forest. So there is active management that occurs on her property. And once again, um, those landowners are really what make the success that we do, you know, a reality. So, you know, what do they come to us? They're interested in learning about a way to kind of keep their property a certain way. And, you know, one of the main tools we do working with landowners is a conservation easement. And kind of those five five bullet points that you see is private. I mean, that's one of the key things. These are agreements made with private individuals, um, you know, where the land still remains in private ownership. We'll probably talk about that a little bit more. Easements are also flexible. So, you know, we're working with the landowner to help determine what their goals and objectives are, and also with what Little Forks' goals are. And generally every easement that we have is is different in some way because land's different, people have different objectives. And at the end of the day, we're working together to, to meet that. The key other term we'll talk about is perpetual. Conservation easements run with the property. So when that land transfers on to the next owner or the next generation or family member, that conservation easement stays intact, um, you know, forever. And I think we'll talk about continued uses and things that can happen on the property, for whether it's farming or forestry or just enjoying nature or, you know, hunting and uh, other activities out there. And that last bullet point, voluntary, is kind of one of the other keys. You know, we're coming to people working together to make these agreements intact. So it's like I said, it's a collaboration between a landowner and the conservancy to help develop these. And so, you know, the nuts and bolts, what's the definition? There's another picture of C.O. Bauer and Elizabeth Levi on top of him, uh, which is a, uh, another conservation easement donor. So it's a legal agreement between a landowner and a conservancy that protects the specific conservation values of a, of a piece of property. And we'll talk a little bit more about conservation values and uh, 
One thing, as I mentioned, that agreement is recorded at the County Register of Deeds and runs with the property. So we'll talk about like how it runs with the land from one owner to the next owner. But really when we think about why are we doing some of these, what's some of the, the reasoning behind it? And we like, you know, it really comes down to kind of what's the, the public benefit. When you think about the Little Forks Conservancy as I started out earlier is we are a 501c3 nonprofit. And so part of what we were formed for is to working to improve our community. And that's when we come back to what are conservation easements supposed to do? What is that, you see in quotes, conservation purposes? And that's where the public benefit comes in. And so we'll see these in our agreements to a certain extent is conserving land for outdoor recreation or the education uh, of the general public. Uh, last year, we did a project with the uh, Leon P. Marchus chapter of Crowd Unlimited that actually uh, had wording within that document to continue to have outdoor recreation for the public to allow for fishing and using that resource. One of the key, one of the key public benefits when we're working with most of the landowners is protecting natural habitats for fish, wildlife, or plants. Uh, I mean, that's a pretty common one that we work with. Uh, you'll also see preserve certain open space. And this is uh, another benefit is property that has a scenic enjoyment that is, that is tied into the local landscapes. And the other one is pursuant to clearly delineated governmental policies. So the work that we do is supported by the state of Michigan, by the, the federal government to continue to do these work that helps to benefit, you know, overall the community as a whole, but also the land and natural resources. One thing that Little Forks really, the other benefit that sometimes comes up is historically important land or certified historic structures, which is a little, we don't do a lot of structure work, but some properties that we have protected like our April Preserve uh, has some pretty significant logging history that ties into it. So what are those aspects? What makes up a conservation easement? I stated it a little while ago, perpetuity forever. So these are agreements that they're not just 10 years, they're not 30 years, they basically run with the property. The other thing to think about is, you know, how are those agreements customized? Um, you know, how do we develop those goals and objectives? A lot of times it starts out with just a landowner questionnaire, a discussion, a cup of coffee to kind of determine, you know, kind of what works for the landowner and what goes into that. One of the other things, this, this comes up at a lot at our, a lot at our our public meetings back when we used to do those, and hopefully we'll do public meetings again and, and get to see people and you know, meet folks face to face is public access is not granted. The land continues to remain as private property. Um, so that's another thing that is, you know, kind of the unique part about conservation easements is Little Forks does not own the property. We own an interest in that land in a sense. And, and if you think about it, there's a variety of things you could do with your property. What an easement does is kind of extinguish some of those rights. And we'll touch on that uh, a little bit more. And we'll talk a little bit about some of the financial benefits that come to landowners. And then the other thing is not any charity or even any conservation organization can hold a conservation uh, easement. I mean, you have to be a qualified organization, which is uh, something that's defined by the IRS, I believe, um, to hold these. So one, th one thing I always like to start out about because people want to know, you know, what can I do? What can't I do? What happens on my my property with the conservation easement. And the one thing is, as folks probably know about our landscape is there's a lot of land that's actively managed. And, you know, we have conservation easements that have a forestry component to it. There's lots of woods in our area, lots of trees. So we work with a lot of landowners on discussing the impacts of forestry and future forestry use. Wildlife improvements. I mean, this happens a considerable amount. I'm sure folks are familiar with, you know, improving wildlife habitat for white-tailed deer, uh, doing you know, different native plantings for other, other creatures that are out there. Um, and the other thing we run into is agriculture, you know, so also working the land is continually farmed and managed for farmland, which also is another thing that uh, happens on conservation easement projects. And then also keep in mind, these are still properties that people continue to live on and have structures, have a house, Sometimes they have, you know, new structures, new barns, a variety of things that also tie into actively managed land. And then the other part, maybe occasionally, sometimes an additional subdivision may tie into a conservation easement. Really, it just depends on 
what's what the landowner's objectives are, like I said a little while ago, and you know, kind of what fits with uh, the conservancy. I always like to show a, a good example. This is a piece of property that we hold a conservation easement on, and a lot of habitat restoration can still continue to happen. So if you look at you know, one thing there is, you know, native like grass planting. So at one point, this property is predominantly agriculture. The landowner had an interest in, in this gentleman's case, trying to improve pheasant and deer habitat. So he wanted to have more native grasses. Uh, also an area for other wildlife. So wetland restoration. So changing a piece of, a piece of the land from just kind of a, a little drainage, but to try to expand on that. And one thing that we've done in the past too is, help some of our partners find some of those natural resource uh, people in the area that could help advise on some of these projects. And then also tree planting. Lots of folks that we work with plant lots of trees. So you'll see on this piece of property that still has a little bit of farming, but also has other activities that are going on, uh, despite the fact you know, that there's still a conservation easement that's keeping that 100 plus acres intact and continue to be uh, managed to improve habitat. A couple photos uh, just to show in the lower right is some native grass plantings and areas that have been prepped for, for that like farming or even an old photo of me and my dog many years ago. Uh, and also folks, as I mentioned, looking at some of the wetland restoration and preservation. So you'll see uh, the upper left was a, a project on a conservation easement property through the US Fish and Wildlife Service Partners for Wildlife Program that created a little small wet area and then they put in some uh, duck boxes. So how does all this happen? I mean, really, you know, from, from the work we do, it really starts out with a phone call, an email, uh, even anymore now, maybe a Facebook, you know, message that, hey, I want to learn a little bit more. And so when people reach out to us, the first thing to do is kind of get together, set up that site visit and go out and look at the land, talk about little forks, you know, make sure people understand who we are, what our background is, what our history is, is really helpful. And then also learning a little bit about the property, how it's been used, sometimes how long it's been in the family. Like I said, we have some projects that have been in the in families for probably upwards of 100 years. Um, and you'll see a, sometimes a common thread like with those same landowners that that really strong tie to the land kind of is one of the reasons folks sometimes reach out to us. And through that, it's kind of, you know, what are those goals and objectives? And that's where we kind of, you know, we usually start out with the landowner questionnaire that at least helps frame some of that information for us. But part of it is just, you know, having that talk and going over things. And then the other part of, you know, we also as, a, as an organization have criteria that we follow to make sure that when we do projects that they meet what our goals are too. Because you think about it, we talk about per perpetuity a lot, a lot. Uh, you know, we continue to work with that with our conservation easement landowners through the current generation, the next generation, the generation after that. I mean, I'm sure once I'm gone, the, the next me and the following me will continue to, to follow these agreements and uh, ensure that you know those properties are protected. But really, once we have kind of reviewed it against our criteria, talked to landowners about goals and objectives, we start to draft basically a uh, a conservation easement is kind of our starting point. So we have an initial document that we use to kind of get feedback from the landowner, you know, kind of see if we're kind of moving in the in the right direction. And then eventually, as we kind of work through it, we start to finalize that agreement and get closer to a, you know, near end product. So really some of the basics. So what goes into a conservation easement? This comes up a lot. And I'll, I'll be honest, the, the conservation easement that we use is based off of a a Michel, Michigan model conservation easement that's used statewide uh, through a variety of organizations. We start out within these documents talking about the purpose, you know, why are we doing this? You know, also talking about uh, what those conservation values are. And then kind of the, what I usually say is kind of the, what can happen, what the, what the can't happen, you know, allowed and prohibited actions. And then what's built into the document that continues to make it hold up the test of time in case something, to be frank, if something ever goes wrong on a conservation easement, if somebody violates those terms and agreements, Little Fork's there to make sure that your goals and, and wishes for your property are maintained. So yeah, I mean, conservation values is kind of a, an interesting term and you know, usually we have to kind of define it a little bit, but what we're really talking about are those features of a piece of property. You know, what makes it important? What makes it special, both from a natural resource 
value standpoint, a community standpoint, uh, even from a recreational standpoint, from protecting it, making sure that the river stays healthy. Um, so we look at things like scenic views, like landscapes that uh, you know maintain kind of a rural quality of life. Uh, things that we talk about agricultural lands, we look at the different soils uh, that make that agricultural, that farmland pr productive. The other things we look at is adjacent to other protected lands. You know, we've been very fortunate in certain parts of our service area, especially in the Cedar River watershed, to work with a handful of landowners in, in close proximity to the to each project that kind of creates a bigger block of protected land. Because if you think about it, protecting one property is great, but if you could work with a few others and increase that scope, it really has a, a pretty positive impact on conservation in that community. And the other thing we look at too, you know, as I mentioned at the start, Little Forks was really formed as an organization about protecting river land. The, the Titabawassee, the Chippewa, the Pine River in Midland County is kind of where we got our origins as an organization. But over time, as we've kind of expanded our, our scope, so to speak, uh, you know, we've, we've reached into other counties, the Cedar River watershed, the tobacco River watershed are both important areas of conservation for us. Uh, and then the other part is we look at other ways that, you know, other things that support this work. And, you know, we're involved in a variety of watershed management plans that are developed. And generally when we're working on those plans, we're working to have that, that conservation component that making sure that there's a land preservation aspect to that, which would be supported by federal, state, or local entities. So once we think about the conservation values, next we start thinking about reserve rights. And you'll see that in the document. And one thing, you know, I always preface it when I talk to people, a conservation easement's not, not a little document, but it's, a, it's about 20 plus pages. Uh, and granted, a lot of the work that we do is kind of in the front end of the document. As I mentioned, that Michigan model, uh, it was basically created by attorneys and conservation practitioners throughout the state to make sure we cover like a lot of the bases that tie into helping these, these agreements last forever, as I mentioned. But we talked to landowners about forest management. I mean, our, our landscape is pretty dominated by trees, as most folks know. So we work with folks on making sure that, you know, talking about current forest management, future forest management, and making sure, you know, that it's consistent with what we're doing and what the landowner's objectives are. So in our conservation easements, we, you know, landowners are still managing their trees. They're managing issues with trees. Like anymore, we're dealing with invasive pests, whether it's emerald ash borer, or unfortunately, in some cases, we're starting to see oak wilt kind of move in a little bit in kind of our northern service area. Uh, another activity we talk about is farming. Uh, you know, uh, quite, a, quite a few of our properties have a farming component that ties into it. So, you know, we're looking at kind of making sure that you know, if there's existing abilities to continue that because farming does make up our rural character. We also evaluate what structures are out on the property, whether it's existing houses, buildings, or a variety of things. And those are things as we work through the process, we try to work with the landowner to see what kind of some of those future needs might be. And also as we talk about, you know, getting onto properties and there's roads, trails, and a variety of things that we're working with folks and making sure that you can continue to, you know, obviously access the property. And then another thing that comes up a lot is habitat improvements. As I mentioned earlier, a lot of our land is pretty actively managed. So we really want to make sure folks can continue to improve land for wildlife, uh, improve land for, you know, water quality, and, you know, even from helping to improve um, projects along rivers and streams. So the key thing with a lot of that is when I talk about like those purposes, why are we doing this conservation easement? We need to make sure that kind of our reserve rights are consistent with protecting those conservation values. And that's why we work together to put these agreements together to make sure we achieve those. But we also talk about kind of what can happen. And I'll be honest, most of the folks that initially come to Little Forks, to, you know, talk to us about, they really don't want to see their property subdivided. So folks that have, whether it's a 40 and 80, 400 acres, or even larger, sometimes folks want to see those big pieces of property kind of remain intact. The other things too, and sometimes we talk about, you know, disturbance to the, you know, the surface of the property. So sand or gravel mining, which may have some impacts on the property. Also things like industrial activities, you know, keeping, uh, you know, things off of a piece of property and which also ties into kind of whether it's removing vegetation on, you know, whether it's 
improper management of the property, or even uh, start talking about dumping and things, just helping those, anything that may adversely affect those conservation values. So I think a, a good example is to talk about when I'm looking at, at this piece of property and I can see, say I have my cursor, this is kind of an, a unique, you got river land, you've got some farmland, you've got some forest land, uh, and then you even have a home site here. And you have another home site right here. So within this piece of property, you know, there's a lot going on. So the conservation for this, conservation easement for this piece of property works to protect all of this river frontage that runs there. That was one of the key focuses on it. The other part is you have some pretty good areas of forest land. So making sure that forested land continues to have that character, there's still some active management that ha happens on it. On this property, a lot of it's working with removal of uh, dead trees from emerald ash borer and also working on invasive control. So a lot of those folks may remember autumn olive uh, is pretty prevalent out here. But also you see you have farmland through here. That areas continue to be farmed for, in this case, mainly row crops, uh, corn, beans, uh, and the like. But you also have a house site. So you know generally you have a development area where folks have an existing house. Maybe at some point they want to remove that and build a new house and have you know areas for you know, some sheds and barns, or just to continue to use that as uh, kind of a, a single family residence. In this property case, there's actually another little building site on the southern portion that was used at one point from another tenant on the property. So you'll see, this is pretty typical. You know, most of the, the projects we work with, there's just not just one thing going on, but there's many things. And, you know, we work to accommodate those and see how, you know, we can protect those features while at the same time allowing for some of those continued uses. So keeping going through, how do we keep working through the process? The other things we have to do is we have to look at the title of the property. Uh, I mean, hard to think when I was you know, starting out years ago that I'd spent a lot of time, not too dissimilar from you know, a realtor looking at the title history of the property, what encumbrances might be there. Are there any liens? Are there any leases? Uh, you know, we always got to make sure that the folks that we're working with own the property, which you know, is always important. And then internally, we have a committee, a land committee that reviews uh, our projects and also helps guide the work we do. When you think about that, kind of that first slide, slide, Little Forks is a pretty small organization. You know, we have, you know, currently four employees. We have an AmeriCorps member, but a lot of our, our, our governing structures, we have a board of directors, and then we have a land committee that's made up of some board, some board members and also folks from the community with an interest in uh, land conservation. After our land committee reviews it, we provide that information to our board of directors for their final review. And then once that's done, we work on completing what's called a baseline document. And that's kind of one of the important things we put together, which I like to think of as kind of like a natural resource report with all as much history and information of the property at the time of the conservation uh, easement was put in place. And then at the end, it really is just signing and recording it. So we do all this work at the end, then we're just signing paperwork and, uh, but it's pretty exciting because it is a, a process. Sometimes, you know, people ask, how long does it take to do this? You know, sometimes it's six months or maybe shorter. Sometimes it could be a few years or maybe longer. You know, once again, it depends on like, like what I usually do is provide that starting point of information and kind of like planting a seed and just seeing how it grows. But the other part, you know, I talked about, you know, these are long-term agreements as a, as a charitable conservation organization, you know, we have to make sure that we can continue to, you know, steward these agreements. And the first thing we got to do is have good relationships with our landowners. So we reach out each year to our, our conservation easement landowners. We provide them with some information. We give them opportunities to, you know, participate in stewardship series and different educational opportunities, you know, virtually or uh, on the ground. Um, so we want to make sure, you know, we all get along. We have an open dialogue. The other thing, every year we come out and monitor the easement as part of our responsibility. We have to make sure that those terms and conditions are being upheld. And part of that also is ensuring that we have a stable funding source. So, uh, you know, making sure that we have the ability to have staff or someone in the future uh, to continue to do this work. And then also the, which ties back into the resources and commitment, because if something does go wrong on a conservation easement property, we have to make sure that it's corrected. Those landowners are entrusting us in a sense with, you know, kind of 
a little bit of how they want to see their property in the future and how it is currently. So if an easement is violated, you know, um, we would be legally responsible to enforce those restrictions. Um, and then I talked, you know, a little bit way in that earlier slide about some of the financial benefits. You know, so why do sometimes people do this? You know, obviously most of, you know, most if not all of our projects start out with folks that have that relationship with their land. They want to see it protected. They, you know, the land means a lot to them, but there are some financial benefits. And I'll just cover these a little bit, but, uh, and I'm always happy afterwards, or if people want to reach out kind of one-on-one -on -one to talk about this, but that key bullet point right under here is good tax advice and running the numbers is really important if you are interested in a federal income tax deduction. And this once again ties into your, federal, your, your personal income taxes. So there is a tax deduction, a federal income tax deduction for donating a conservation easement on a piece of property. And you'll see kind of, it's actually broken down into two categories, you know, kind of non-farm and people who get income from farm or forestry and just what percentage of your adjusted gross income could be um, deducted uh, based on your income. And you'll see, because you, you know, the amount of a federal income tax deduction can vary. You know, our once our caveat again is, you know, we're not financial advisors. We ask people to go talk to their tax advisors, their legal counsel. Folks will see that in pretty much, you know, a lot of the letters we send to people, but, uh, you know, if you can't use all of that donation up in one year, it could carry forward a maximum of 15 years. Uh, so those are things that the government put in place to kind of add an additional incentive for doing these sort of projects. The other one that comes up, well, the other one is kind of how do you determine the value? And I'm just going to go, this is like a real, real basics, but part of it is you have to have a qualified appraisal by uh, an appraiser that is familiar with conservation easements and conservation easement transactions. And really what they're doing is they're looking at the before value of a piece of property and the after value. And then what that winds up doing is coming up with the amount of the potential deduction. So that's, that's kind of a simple way to do it. But you think about it, when you're putting a conservation easement on your property, there's basically things you can't do anymore. You know, you can't subdivide it into, you know, 50 different lots or, you know, Put a mini mall out there. So you're really kind of changing a little bit of what that value can be. And that's why an appraiser has to do that. You know, we don't tell folks what that change in value could be. You know, that's where we just, you know, point people in that direction. And then here's just a real, real rough example. So, you know, you think about it, if a piece of property is, is valued at, at $200,000, you put the value in the property restricted, decreases it to 120,000, the value of the donation, that difference is 80. And that's a really simple uh, analysis of that. But this kind of is kind of a, a real broad general example. I mean, once again, every easement's different, you know, everything can affect kind of what that change may be. And also all communities are different, land values are different as folks probably know. Um, the other one that people talk to us a lot about are property taxes. So this comes up quite a bit. One thing is conservation easements can potentially lower the value of your property taxes, but really what it comes down to is what the, the value of the property is on your, your tax rolls. And this is a little more nuanced because once again, you see that one bullet, it's up to the local assessors to see what that is and to see what that change in value is. But one thing easements do do, uh, uh, from uh, PA 446, which is Public Act 446, is cap undeveloped portion of the property. So keeping those that taxable value capped when it transfers uh, to another owner. And there's other, other ways to, to cap your value, which um, if folks look into that, but that's one of the things that a conservation easement does. But really that key is the undeveloped portion, not necessarily the houses and where structures are. And this is kind of, you know, just a little slide, you know, the photo on the left is from one of our conservation easements on the West Branch of the Cedar River, now that I'm looking at that. But, you know, once again, prevents that taxable value from popping up uh, on the undeveloped portions of a piece of property. But as I mentioned, it's still, you know, if there's homes, other structures that are affected. So really just to kind of wrap things up, you know, conservation easements, you know, can fit with a variety of land types, you know, whether it's farmland, forest land, wetlands, you know, they're Every piece of property is different. There's different features about it. Different landowners' objectives are different. So, you know, we really try to work together to kind of 
put all this together to land, you know, kind of what a landowner wants to do and see if it fits with the conservancy's objectives and come up with that. And then I talked just real briefly at the end about financial incentives, which may be available. And I will say after this uh, presentation, we'll send an email with some of the links on our website with some of the information and maybe some other information that will help in some of the uh, decision making. Like I said, going back to that very part, it all starts with education. It all starts with learning a little bit about what a conservation easement is, kind of taking those first steps to, to hear more and, you know, continue doing this. But, you know, thinking like, you know, we're talking, initially we're talking like little picture, you know, little forks. We work in the Titabawassee River watershed, uh, you know, mainly in those handful of counties, but we're also looking statewide, you know, kind of throughout Michigan because, you know, there's 30 plus conservancies working at all different scales. There's organizations that work statewide. There's organizations that work just on a township level, but, you know, at the end of the day, we're all working to protect some of the state that we all love. And some of that focuses on watershed protection, looking at blocks of habitat, uh, connecting land to some of those resources is what you know conservation easements do and what we help landowners do. Um, statewide, there's over 600,000 acres of protected land by conservancies and land trusts in the state. And that's easements that might be land that we own or manage or where we've helped other folks uh, protect land. But also, you know, thinking about organizations like us uh, protecting land throughout the area. So as you know, as we started out as a, a pretty small movement way back, uh, I don't know enough about, you know, Conservancy's history in Michigan. It was probably in the, the late, you know, late 60s throughout, uh, continue to work and grow as a movement because at the end, you know, this is, you know, we're private nonprofit organizations, you know, working voluntary with landowners to kind of meet those same objectives. So we really fit that, you know, we're trying to help folks get done what they want to do on their properties working together. And I think that's it. I think I still have left some time for questions if folks have that. Um, but I appreciate everybody listening and learning a little bit more about our program and the work we do. Hello, Alan. This is Keith Brooks. Can you hear me? Hey, Keith. How are you doing? I can hear hey. you great. Oh, good. Well, I, I joined in again today to, uh, to listen to your talk. Um, thought it would be interesting and thought I would give a little bit of my perspective um, coming into the conservation easement uh, world a little different way than than what you guys uh, usually do with other landowners. But for me, if I can share a little bit about my experience. Um, um, so you had a piece of property for sale mm -hmm. um, that was up on the Gladwin Midland County line, um, Coolidge Road off M18. And of course, living in the Coleman area and being a biologist myself and um, wanting to have some my main goal was getting me a piece of property that uh, that I would be able to develop and main use for hunting. But a little perspective on on the piece of property that I bought from you. The main driver for me was I was able to get a 44 acre piece of land at a very reasonable price. Um, I would say that working with Elan and Doug was the um, the director at that time uh, was a very pleasurable experience. Um, I didn't know what to think of the conservation easement um, and how restricted it would be, but actually um, I believe it wasn't fully developed or wasn't signed yet until I bought the property and working with Elan and Doug um, was a very, I would say, flexible um, arrangement. I was able to build in some things that I wanted for the property. There was already, I think, a two acre building site available for building if I did want to build a house or, or another structure there. So um, I found it to be uh, a, a very good experience working with the group and being a biologist myself, uh, my interest in protecting land uh, seemed to fit good with the conservation easement. Um, as Alan is aware, I've done a lot of management on the property, um, adding wildlife food plots for, for, um, for wildlife you know, use and uh, hunting. 
And um, I would say that, you know, among all the things I've done out there, planting the trees and seeing them mature since I bought the property in 2003 uh, has been great. Um, adding the wildlife plantings for food plots has increased uh, several species of animals out there. Um, we have a very large presence of wild turkeys now that we never had on that property before because it's fairly low and swampy and not, not really turkey habitat. But in some of the areas where I was able to put in plantings, um, I've increased the number of turkeys that use the property. Um, I don't know if I've increased the number of deer that use the property, but we've had some very successful um, hunting seasons. I'm also a member of um, like Quality Deer Management Association. And um, so a lot of habitat and, and tips working with them as well. But just wanted to give a perspective from a property owner that, from a property that had a conservation easement on it when I bought it. And, you know, Ilan, you can always use me as a resource. Um, <laughs> if some people are unsure of, you know, putting their property in a conservation easement, I can kind of give, I guess, a perspective on my uh, longevity with Little Forks. And uh, it's been a very good working relationship um, with you. And I guess that's probably all I have to input, but I just wanted to, uh, to give you my perspective. Yeah, th thanks, Keith. That's great. I mean, uh, you know, I I've appreciated working with you over the years, too. And, and I think that the thing that really helps our program out the most are, are, are folks like Keith and our other landowners that basically, you know, help spread the good word of what we do. So um, and usually when we do some of these presentations, we usually have a landowner, but, you know, virtually we're just we're just kind of feeling things out. But, you know, thanks for what you had to say, Keith. And uh, I will definitely take you up on using you for a reference and in, uh, in the future. Okay, great, thanks. Hi, I'm Terry Brockoff from Gladwin. Hi, Terry. Thank you. Yep. Uh, sorry, I was a little bit late, uh, and uh, I was just wondering: uh, putting land into a conservancy is does that? Uh, require you to allow other people to come on to the property? Yeah, and, and, I'll, tell you, and I'll tell you, that's one, one of the, the, the things about conservation easements is they do not allow public access onto the property. So that land continues to stay in private ownership. The conservancy, as I mentioned, does come out to make sure that those you know, the things that we've agreed to are intact, but really the land is still private property. Uh, and when the land transfers to the next generation, Little Forks doesn't own it. I've actually, I've had people say like, you know, when so-and-so is not alive anymore, you're the owner. That's not the case. It goes to whether it's the family member who inherits the property or if the property is sold. And as I mentioned, we've been doing this, this is our, our 25th year in business. And we are starting to see those properties, you know, change hands and we're meeting with new landowners. And you know, luckily Keith's been there for almost 20 years now. We got a couple more years to go, I think, but uh, really these, uh, we're seeing second generation and in some case we're on the third generation of landowners. So, and the property is still in private ownership. But great question, we get that. It's very important to understand that distinction. Uh, the piece of property that, that my wife and I live on is we've been there 25 years and uh, Actually, that's not true, 35 years. <laughs> and uh, uh, we have a 10 acre spring fed lake that's 27 foot deep. Wow. Uh, there's runoff from a couple cedar swamps that often will dry up by July or August for two, three months. Mm -hmm. uh, some years it doesn't dry up at all, but it's, it's a a minuscule runoff from those two areas. Uh, even when there's no water coming into the lake from those two cedar swamps, uh, there's still water going out of the lake and the water goes out. We're, we're just a quarter mile from the city limits of Gladwin on the south side. And uh, the, the runoff from our lake goes about a quarter mile before it's into the Cedar River south of the, south of the city park. 
Um, so that's that's kind of the, the property as a 10 acre lake, 23 acres of property. And then uh, another uh, person owns seven acres. Uh, it's actually a total of 30 acres. Ooh, nice. So, um, and it has, it has tree plantings on it from my father-in-law back in about 1960. Oh yeah. Red, red pine. Uh, so there's, there's plantings along Stickle Road and there's plantings along uh, the south and west property lines uh, that, so those trees are, you know, like 60 years old and starting oh, yeah. to get up there in size a little bit. So I just, uh, there's one thing that was on the property. There's kind of like a, a, I'm going to say a landfill. Mm -hmm. There's uh, some old appliances and some things that have been thrown into a hole. <laughs> that uh, is there any help on cleaning something like that up? Uh, it, it sort of sometimes it depends. Um, I, I know at, at one point, you know, there, you know, if it was an old land, you know, which does occasionally happen is people acquire land that may have been owned by a township. Um, and I know sometimes there's been some funding from the state maybe to help with that, but I'd, I'd have to look in, into that a little bit more. Maybe we could chat off, chat offline about okay. that. Okay. Yeah. Is your, is your phone number available? Yep. I think it's, is it the, well, I won't go too far. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll just, I think it's on the last slide. So yeah, give me a call and we could chat some more, talk about your property. I mean, like I said, this is all about providing folks information. And, you know, the one thing is, is at the start, Little Forks is a resource to community members, you know, whether it's conservation easements or other ways to improve the natural resource, we're there to help. And that's what we, you know, why we, why Sarah puts together the stewardship series while our other staff that's involved is, you know, here to kind of improve our region, not, not just, you know, not just for Little Forks, but for everybody. And that's, you know, kind of why we do this. But there'll be a slide at the end, I think, with okay. some of that information to get a hold of us. So Terry, uh, this is Keith Brooks, um, another uh, guy that was just speaking earlier on the phone. So the property that I bought had a conservation easement on it. But so your property, if I understand correctly, does not have a conservation easement on it currently. Is that correct? No. Okay, well, just just a point of interest. You describe your property as having that spring-fed lake, uh, the cedar swamps, and that drains into the Cedar River. Um, I think, if I can speak for Elan and Little Forks, those are exactly the types of properties that they want to protect in a conservation easement because that um, that drainage from your lakes and from those cedar swamps is um, maintains and increases the health. The natural health of that waterway. So, I mean, it sounds like a perfect property to protect, you know, under such thing as a conservation easement. Um, like I said, I, I've worked with uh, Alan and Little Fork since I bought their property from them back in 2003. And, uh, you know, me being a, a biologist myself, um, I, I agree with you know, the, the sentiment of what Little Forks does to preserve the natural area, not only for us, but for future generations. And this is the area that we live. And this is the area that we're tasked as land stewards, landowners to, to protect. So um, your property sounds like a, a wonderful uh, Place for a conservation easement. Now, obviously, that's totally up to you. But the way you described it, that's exactly what Little Forks is is about. We had uh, an eagle land on the dike between. We have a pond and then the lake, and uh, yeah. we had an eagle land there on the area between the lake and the pond about a week ago, about that's a month sorry. ago. Uh, the deer have been crossing the 10 acre lake on the ice during the winter. Mm -hmm. you know, because our house is a quarter mile off the road and we're at the back of our property and the back of our property then is a quarter mile from M18 to the west. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, the deer quite often walk through our backyard 
uh, when they're going around the lake. And uh, we've had as many as 25 deer in the backyard, uh, you know, in the last couple months uh, at one time. Uh, it's hard to tell if there's any bucks because you, you got to <laughs> they, see. They've lost their antlers now, yes, I know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, uh, but be, being a hunter, you know, with my property, hunters are great conservationists, in my opinion, at least most of them. Yeah. Um, but uh, whether you hunt or not, it's awesome to see wildlife on a property that you live on and that you've managed. And, um, and if you're fortunate, you know, to be able to harvest some of those, if you are a hunter and enjoy the, um, the natural uh, wild game meat that I enjoy, I mean, it's it's all a big picture to me. Yeah. Uh, so that's, uh, yeah, we, we've had a bobcat, and this is quite a while ago, probably 30 years ago, a bobcat walk into the backyard and it was in the summer. Mm -hmm. We were sitting in the family room watching a Detroit Tiger ball game. Wow. And it walked out of the woods and you could see the tufts of hair on its ears. And mm -hmm. uh, my neighbor, about a month and a half ago, came home and he was pulling up to his garage at 7.30 at night and he swears that he had a cougar in front of his garage door wow. in, his, in the lights. And then, I mean, the, he didn't, have, didn't get a picture. He just had the tracks running down toward the lake from his house. Uh, and we, he did do a sighting report for the DNR on their mm -hmm. website, uh, but uh, so there's, and we've had black bear come in and uh, work on the bird feeders in the spring. Uh, yeah, for sure. So there, I mean, and this is all within a quarter mile of the hospital at Gladwin. That's, a, uh, that's yep. amazing. Well, yeah. well Keith, Keith sold our property, our program so well, Keith. I think next time you're just going to do this presentation. <laughs> 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 you're going to be on the hook that Keith Brooks Stewardship Series 2022. Uh, but yeah, I think I think a good point is like those those memories of like seeing eagles. I mean, I can tell you what I saw my first eagle when I came to Michigan back in 99. I mean, it still sticks in my head. I mean, so those are the things that make these properties like yours special. And, you know, the Cedar River watershed, which uh, just like our last presentation, we're pretty active in. And it's really one of our, our gems in the area. And so helping to protect those properties really makes a, a big difference. And like Keith said, on, on water quality, but wildlife habitat and a variety of things. The water is really cold in our lake. I know we've, over the years, we've had a swimming uh, float out in the middle of the lake. And when you dive in the water and you get about a foot or two foot below the surface, <laughs> It's a lot different than the first foot. <laughs> nice. Definitely spring fed then for sure. You should you should consider planting some trout in there if you don't already have some. The problem is my father and I tried to do that. Uh, the whole lake is like uh, uh, a silt bottom. There's no gravel or sand any place. Okay. Uh -huh. And uh, he tried to plant brook, brook trout and uh, they, they wouldn't reproduce and... Uh, there's an, a flow going over an 18 inch vertical tube that then drops down and goes through a dike uh, that he had a permit to put on the lake back in about 1960 from the DNR, probably mm -hmm. before the DEQ existed. Uh, I'm not sure about that, but you know we have the permit for that dam. Uh, and uh, so uh, water, I mean, the, the trout never reproduced uh, in the pond or in the lake. Right. Yeah, well, usually brown trout and, and rainbow trout are more conducive to planting in lakes where there may not be. I mean, you can actually get, I believe, hybrid trout that don't reproduce, but, um, you know, but browns and, and rainbows are definitely more hardy, and yeah. that's why there's a, a better population of brown trout in the Cedar River as opposed to brook trout, because they can handle a little bit mm -hmm. less... Uh, pristine conditions, I'll say. Okay. Yep. Anyway, sounds like a nice piece of property, Terry. Yep, thank you. Definitely, I agree. All right, maybe I'll turn it over to you, Sarah, as we're running close to one o'clock. 
No, sounds good if you want to do the next. Yep. Um, so this was the second in the series. Uh, our, the DNR fish surveys is on our website and on our YouTube channel. And this will be, is, has been recorded as well and will be posted in those places to watch again later or send to people you think would be interested in a conservation easement. Up next is Watershed Health, where we'll be covering our stream sampling program and what we do to monitor the health of the Cedar River watershed. We'll also have a guest speaker from the Huron River Watershed Council where the statewide program called MyCore is um, hosted from and organized uh, throughout the state. Um, so he'll touch on the statewide efforts and then we'll go into detail of what we do and how you can help. And then in May, we will cover some of the aspects of uh, conservation at home, some of the more stuff you can do on your land to make it more environmental friendly um, and habitat. And all that stuff can be found on our website or our social media um, at littleforks.org slash stewardship series. All right. Oh, sorry. There's my contact information. <laughs> I forgot I was a, I'll, once again, I'll follow up with Sarah. Thanks for everybody for attending. Uh, you could either, you know, reach out to us um, by phone or email, you know, Facebook, a variety of things. But um, yeah, I mean, I think it's, you know, the, like I said, it's just talking to folks and providing that information. And thanks for everybody who attended. Yeah, Alan, one more thing. This is Keith. Sure. I just just wanted to tell you as far as my uh, involvement with Little Forks, my plan is to retire in about five years. So, um, you know, I've done some volunteer efforts with your group before and uh, would be willing to do more. Um, after I retire, I should have lots more time to uh, help out and uh, looking forward to, um, to maybe doing some more volunteer work with you and uh, promoting uh, the conservancy in the future as well. So. I think that sounds great, Keith. And I mean, one thing I, I probably should have said at the start is, you know, that's what kind of the thing that helps make Little Forks, you know, we have a great staff, we have a, a great board of directors, but it's our volunteers that help us get the work done. It's also kind of our members, folks that donate to us that help support our work. And then, you know, the community members that could help, you know, like Keith's done, talk about the, the, the positive effect of a conservation easement or impacts that we do. So uh, yeah, so there's a lot of ways that um, folks can get involved and, and help support our work. All right, I guess that's it. I'll let Sarah okay, take have over. A great day. And have a great day, everybody. Happy St. Patrick's Day. I hope folks like my green background. That was intentional. <laughs> Maybe <laughs> not, though. No. All right, thank you. Hey, Thanks, have everyone. a good day.